Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so in today's session, we'll have Theresa Eimer from uh, Hanover. So she's a PhD student with Marius Lindauer. And yeah, she's been talking about challenges in HPO for reinforcement learning. Yeah, so I'm quite interested to see what's been going on in RL, like con conjecture with uh, AutoML. So yeah, like uh, the floor is all yours, Theresa. Thank you, Abba. Uh, also, thanks for the invitation. Uh, as Abba already said, I'll be talking about the interface between AutoRL and AutoML, auto and specifically what kind of impact AutoML methods can have in AutoRL, because I do think there's a lot of space for AutoML expertise to improve our understanding of reinforcement learning. So, ah, it even works. But why am I talking about reinforcement learning in the first place? Um, what I think is very interesting about reinforcement learning is uh, the difference to a typical supervised learning setting where we have some data, and then we train on that data, and then we have a finished end product model. And in reinforcement learning, we uh, actually generate the data that we train on, not only once, but we continuously generate data, train on this data, use the model that we now trained on the data to generate new data. So we have a loop that is very dynamic, uh, and that has obviously a lot of promise in improving data efficiency and improving the data quality of the models we look at if we manage to make it work right. But um, yeah, uh, we're not quite there as you probably know, reinforcement learning work, but is uh, somewhat confined to its domain. And I think uh, AutoML can make a big difference here. And this is my TLDR of what I'll be talking about in this talk, uh, why I think AutoML people should take a close look at AutoRL as an <laughs> one, I think AutoML methods and tools and also best practices can have quite a high impact in the reinforcement learning community. The knowledge of the reinforcement learning community about hyperparameters in general is often fairly low. Um, and I think even with well-known methods within the AutoML community, we can really increase the understanding of reinforcement learning algorithms, but also increase the performance, obviously, which uh, is a nice goal as well. I also think reinforcement learning is an ideal test bed for dynamic configuration. So for, for example, varying the hyperparameters like the learning rate during training. We know that is also important in other variations of learning, which we've seen, for example, learning rate schedules. But since we have this continuous loop of training and data generation, um, the importance of dynamism is really exaggerated in reinforcement learning. So we see really big effect often for dynamic hyperparameters, which means we can use that to improve our own methods to and to develop no methods for the setting. Last but not least, of course, if we crack this data generation task that makes reinforcement learning so unique, we can use that to improve applications that are really data hungry, like natural language processing, where we've seen results that better data can actually mean we can get away with less data, but get a model of the same quality. So let's look deeper into the reinforcement learning loop, how that actually looks like. It's very basic setting. There's variations to this. But in the very basic setting, we have a task that's encoded in an environment here on the right. And this environment um, is interacted with uh, by what we call an agent. Um, an agent means we have a policy on the left. And uh, this policy selects what to do at each step of this iterative task. So that's what we call an action. And uh, it's decided based upon some state that tells us what is going on currently. So if we can, for example, imagine a maze, that state would likely contain um, the surroundings of the agent in this maze at the current time point. And then obviously, we also get a reward. This reward scores how well the last action did. And we just do this until we solve the task, or maybe did something catastrophic like walk the foot that's the basic setting. And if you know reinforcement learning, or maybe also just know about hyperparameters, you can already infer there are several places that hyperparameters are likely important in this. So for example, if we even just think about selecting how to interact with the environment, we have hyperparameters that are important to the data generation, because obviously that a lot of thought goes into that. What do we need to see? How much do we want to exploit? How much do we want to explore uh, the environment first? Just like in many other optimization paradigms, there are hyperparameters in here that are really important. Then we can also have hyperparameters related to the task, 
for example, um, easy or hard is the version of the task we're looking at currently. Specifically, when we want to generalize, there's many attempts to maybe really start on easier tasks than end on more difficult ones. But all of that also has to be controlled somehow. Just uh, in the same way, we can also reprocess state observations in a way. For example, if we have image observations, which can be quite common, we maybe want to augment them to make uh, the recognition more robust, just as we are used to in computer vision. The same also goes for the reward. Um, there's uh, methods for maybe making this reward a bit more, more understandable to the agent, a bit more easily digestible, so to say. Last but not least, we have optimization hyperparameters like you would be used to um, from other learning paradigms. Adam is the most commonly used optimizer, I think. So you know these hyperparameters, the batch size, learning rate, and so on. So a lot of components. I think that's one of the main things that makes AutoRL uh, challenging specifically, um, is that we have all of the components, and somehow we need to make all of them work together in this very dynamic fashion. The way this auto, uh, this reinforcement learning loop is structured also means that we have dynamic changes. Like, for example, the data needs the kind of data we need to generate during training, obviously evolves. The better we get, the more specific, more exploitative we want to be, right? And uh, that also means we have shifting data distributions during training that we somehow need to optimize for. Uh, and <laughs> It can also mean that the instability in both of these processes is a compound. A compound. Um, so reinforcement learning also tends to be quite unstable with regards to something like random seed. So all of these challenges um, really lead to a similar point, namely that for many hyperparameters, the optimal value is definitely changing during the runtime, especially when we think about data generation and optimization hyperparameters since we have this distribution shift and then also want to generate um, more specific data, especially towards the end of training. And also, coming on to that, especially things like data generation, also makes sense to meta learn. Because, you know, it's a, it's a very complex topic. If we really want to handle data generation, heuristically, it's quite likely to be suboptimal, as we've seen with prior work. So, really, that's a bit of a task, but it is in scope for what AutoML can solve. Like we've seen other areas of AutoML uh, where we have complex systems, um, where we dynamism is important. And I do believe reinforcement learning is a bit special in that way. And we've also seen meta learning deployed pretty successfully. In RL currently though, a lot of these methods are not very well known. Though we see, um, current research papers or in applications, hyperparameter optimization is a necessary point to make existing algorithms work for a given problem. But we most often see grid searches, relatively large grid searches of a, well, few hyperparameters because obviously grid search does not scale to all of these categories that I've shown you before. There are HBO methods that are tailored to reinforcement learning, but they don't really have an established user base as of yet. And thus, what's kind of missing uh, are established settings, how we um, apply these methods reliably so that we actually also always get good results. I think there the Automar community with its tool is just a bit further ahead. It's also interesting, especially trying to exploit this dynamic, uh, this dynamic nature of RL, is that we do see new methods that really lean into this on-the-fly hyperparameter adaption, futuristically, but also learned. Fortunately, we've only seen that work on small domains, and there's not been really a lot of insight on why it's working, when it's working, when we can reliably apply that, and what hyperparameters for even. So I will summarize the state of hyperparameter optimization reinforcement learning that uh, we are missing quite a few insights of uh, what actually to tackle, um, how reinforcement learning works with regards to its hyperparameters. There's also little adoption of um, AutoML tools beyond something simple like grid search. And there's also little awareness of HBO in general. What does it, what exists, how efficient the HBO can be, and also what best practices we should use uh, in research or in application. 
but of course, that's something uh, we can help. And we tried to look at some of the, you could even say basics of AutoML insights for reinforcement learning in our recent uh, ICML paper uh, in collaboration with Marius Lindau and Roberta Aureliano. Uh, we called hyperparameters in reinforcement learning and how to tune them. And uh, we asked ourselves four questions. So the first one is how important is HBO and RL? Can we get away with maybe tuning on a few hyperparameters? Do we really need to look at a large search space? Maybe grid search is okay, right? Um, that's a basic question we really wanted to clarify. Um, then also, how task dependent are the hyperparameters we find in reinforcement learning? Because we have quite a few different tasks for a given algorithm. And often we've seen in these papers that grid searches are really performed for each task separately sometimes. Sometimes um, there's hyperparameter optimization across environments. It's not quite clear just how important it is to really look at tasks, or if we can just tune an algorithm, would be much better, obviously. We also compare a few ways to tune hyperparameters in reinforcement learning, uh, and then ask, Maybe what are the future directions that are currently not covered, that are currently missing in the tools we have for reinforcement learning tuning? We have five main insights. Um, these five main insights we generated with three different uh, um, methods, I would say. The first one are just sweeps over different algorithm, environment, and hyperparameter combinations. So that's 128 combinations in total. Um, we use three algorithms. Eight different environments, though not al every algorithm is compatible with every environment. And then we yes. use all the combinations that were exposed for the framework that we used. So that's quite a few. Um, then we looked at uh, tuning, one with very small budgets. We used a relatively reinforcement learning specific method called population based bandits. Um, then we used DEP, which is DE and hyperband combined, and random search. We chose to use only 10 full target algorithm runs, so 10 full training runs, because while um, some of our experiments were conducted in small and cheap environments, there are definitely reinforcement learning uh, runs that are, that are very expensive, that take days, weeks. And we really wanted to say, uh, wanted to see how much we can get out of this small budget. And we saw we can definitely also work within that thumb. And in the same vein, we tried to scale this up to to state-of-the-art settings, to state-of-the-art benchmarks that are very different from each other um, than using 64 target algorithm runs, because we thought 64 is maybe a budget where we realistically, um, maybe a mid-sized lab could afford this for, uh, for the benchmarks we looked at. And that's maybe a more realistic budget than only 10. So it's number one. It's number one, and as I said, this is maybe not very surprising from an AutoML view. Many hyperparameters in reinforcement learning are relevant. So uh, as I told you, we looked at 128 settings in total, and only eight combinations of algorithm, environment, and hyperparameter show that the worst hyperparameter value is within the standard deviation of the best one. So we can definitely always find, for almost any combination of hyperparameter, environment, and algorithm, one value that really kills the learning run. Here's an example of the Acrobat environment, see the GIF, where uh, the goal would be to swing up above this black line. So we apply force, left and right, swing up. And um, we look at the PPL algorithm, number of epochs, and we can clearly see there's quite a big difference in performance. I think um, about around minus 100 uh, is the optimum. So if we have four epochs, that's quite close to that. Um, but 12 epochs, we drift much, much lower. And we see a similar thing on a very different environment. This is mini grid store key. You can see this uh, red arrow, the agent has to collect a key, then go through the door, at the end, move to the goal. Um, but we still see quite a big difference on a very different reward scale, obviously, <laughs> um, for the batch size. So here we have a mid sized batch size that performs much better than really large or really low batches. That's quite typical of what we've seen. Incident number two is that the hyperparameter importance is definitely dependent on the tasks, however. So uh, we used Bonova uh, to test this, and we see that one to four hyperparameters per algorithm really take the bulk of the importance for the performance. 
but the ordering of these hyperparameters is really different between environments. So again, we see this is a uh, left Acrobat, right Minigrid, this time the same algorithm. And uh, on the left, we see four hyperparameters that are quite important. Um, I mean, the learning rate is around 12% and the others between 20 and 30% importance rating. Um, but you see as marked on the, on the right plot, they are suddenly uh, moved all over the important space with gradient steps, train frequency and learning rate being quite unimportant actually. Um, for mini grid, where the batch size is very important, which in turn doesn't seem to matter much in Acrobot. So that's quite a drastic difference and really shows if we were to, to tune this algorithm on only one of the environments, questionable if it would transfer that well. But the good news is uh, hyperparameter spaces seem to be quite benign, at least. So we looked at uh, partial dependent plots for all hyperparameter combinations, although not for environments. Um, and this is quite representative of what we found. The lighter colors are better. We have a train frequency on the y-axis and the learning rate on the x-axis. Uh, and we can see that as long as we are in the right area of learning rate, we can really uh, get a very good performance. And if we happen to be in the right area of frame frequency, we have a bit more play with the learning rate. So we really don't see only a narrow region where we would perform well, and we also aren't very restricted by the choice of train frequency. So that's actually good news. All of that just sounds like we should tune reinforcement learning, but we should also able be, tuned to, uh, be able to tune your reinforcement learning fairly easily, right? As long as we use a method that scales to many hyperparameters. And we verified that, as I said, with uh, small tuning runs that only use 10 full uh, training runs of the reinforcement learning agents, and then do larger experiments with 64 full runs. With the 10 runs, we uh, did a few more tests on the smaller environments. And what we saw compared to our 128 settings, uh, we were actually able to beat the best performance there, uh, tuning all hyperparameters at once. Um, even with random search, actually. So I was quite surprised with that result, but um, that result was actually only on the tuning seeds. So if we want to test those configurations, mm, we, we need a bit more budget, but with the larger tuning experiments, with the 64 runs, that worked quite well. You can see that on the right, we have a hand-tuned baseline and um, our best HBO method, which overall was DEP, one, two different benchmarks, which are rock. Procton and Brax. So one is a video game, those are the ones on the left, and um, the other one is a robot control benchmark. And we see that overall, um, that really, I would say, outperforms the hand tuned method, uh, tuned method, except for maybe on the Plunder environment. But I have to say, on Big Fish Plunder and Plunder, we know the budget of the baseline, and that was uh, 810 runs, which is over 10 times our budget. So really, compared <laughs> to, to the budget here, I think that's very successful. And we can see, even though reinforcement learning is very expensive often, uh, with I think our longest runs taking up to 24 hours per run, um, 64 runs is still something um, we don't need to be a big industry lab to tune, right? Fortunately, though, um, what we also saw is that overfitting is definitely an issue with all the methods we tested. Um, so, this is maybe a bit of a crowded plot, but what you can see is that. Can always have the tuning performance left and then the test performance of the same method immediately. And especially if you just look at the leftmost plot, the big fish plot, we see this, this very high bar of uh, PV2, PV2, uh, which then drops off drastically in test. I think that's the biggest difference we saw. That's about an eight times performance increase on the tuning seed compared to the test seed. Um, obviously, not quite desirable, but I think that's definitely also due to the fact that PV2 is a method that is supposed to really take into account the dynamic developments within training, and thus probably tends to overfit more if it being a dynamic method. Um, obviously, that's very desirable application, not necessarily desirable when we want to develop general method and want to compare it to other methods, right? Um, so this is definitely an issue that should be tackled. And that I believe Automel has uh, resources. But coming back to our question, 
that we had for ourselves. How important is HBO and reinforcement learning? We think given that we found so many relevant hyperparameters for any given task and such big differences, um, it is very important to not use grid searches, but use scalable HPM methods, like for example, Bayesian optimization. Um, we also saw that the importance of, of the hyperparameters really varied across tasks. So likely it's also something that we need to do for each task. We cannot just compute one set of great hyperparameters for, for example, PPO, and it will work everywhere. That's highly unlikely. Luckily, we've also seen that established hyperparameter optimization methods we know in the automotive community seem to work really well. Um, the RL specific ones, we've seen some failure cases with, um, but I do believe that's partly also due to the maturity of the methods possibly, because these RL specific methods just haven't been developed for a very long time. So yeah, I think there's improvement potential there. And I think there's a very specific area research why we need to improve this. For that, I'm going to give you an example. So we worked on something a while back. Uh, we worked a paper called Hyperparameters in Contextual Reinforcement Learning, highly situational. It was a collaboration with Berlin Benjamin and Marius Landauer. And we looked at a, uh, at a case that actually proved to be a pretty hard type of parameter optimization problem compared to the base case. So we looked at CRL, contextual RL where the agent doesn't only need to solve one task, for example, one of these mini grids or one maze, we uh, need to solve a range of tasks, which you could say is the point of reinforcement learning. If we really need to find one solution, we could probably use something like planning that would be more efficient. So we have an increased learning challenge. We have more diverse data, but also the data generation obviously becomes more difficult because we need to cover a larger base. And we showed that this difficulty actually also increases the difficulty of the hyperparameter optimization task. So what does a CRL task look like? Let's look at this. This is a pendulum, a pretty classic reinforcement learning problem. Um, and uh, in our recent benchmark library call, we're able to kind of change this environment to really create a distribution of tasks. So if we look at this thing, the task is to swing the pendulum up and keep it up by balance it. But I mean, we can just change the makeup of the pendulum a bit, which would be realistic. If we wanted to train a general pendulum balancing agent, that agent should be able to deal with slightly heavier, lighter pendulums, maybe different lengths, right? We could also maybe simulate different gravity forces. I think that's not necessarily extremely realistic on Earth, but it would probably still make the system more robust. It could handle at least slight deviations in the gravity here and there. What we could do, we can define maybe one instance, one context, saying, okay, we want gravity of about minus 10, the standard length, um, standard length pendulum. But then we also want you to be able to deal with a bit longer pendulums. This is what CRL tasks, for example, can look like. But then if we check how agents behave, if we explicitly tell them, this is a generalization task. You need to balance this pendulum that is now longer or shorter, which we call visible here in this plot, or an agent that is just not told that there's any variation that maybe just interprets this as, as noise generalized over. We see uh, surprisingly big differences. So we use PB2 here, performance all the time as well. Uh, and we see that if we explicitly ask for generalization, it actually makes finding stable and well-performing hyperparameter configurations more difficult. So for example, the leftmost plot, that is the pendulum task we just talked about. Uh, each line is one population member of uh, PB2 and all of these are um, these hyperparameter configurations are then um, changed during training time, ideally they improve. So the best outcome here would be the pink line that would probably be the configuration we would want to reuse. And if we just, Let's apply this, for example, length value to the agent, we certainly see a big increase in variability between these configurations. Certainly we see failing configurations, which we didn't see before, right? Even the bad ones just learn something during training. We could uh, re-instantiate them, change the hyperparameters, something would happen. But on the other hand, the best configuration, arguably actually even better than the other one, right? It, it learns really quickly at the start. So uh, we see that it, it becomes uh, 
more difficult to be consistent, apparently. And if we look at each single seat, each configuration, which is on the right for the Acrobat task from before, we see that if we don't explicitly ask for generalization, that is actually very consistent in this case. So here we don't really have a big issue um, tuning on different seats. But if we then expose the context, suddenly we see a big discrepancy between some configurations being able to perform quite well, much better than before, and failing completely, really flatlining. That's, that's hard because uh, actually telling the agent what it's supposed to learn is helpful in learning, quite obviously. If, if we don't tell the agent, um, go to the go goal in the right corner or something, how is it going to figure this out? Like in practical terms, that's just something that's important. Um, but it really makes our meta task, the RTRL task, apparently a lot harder. So what do I think is promise and direction resolving this? I think we should look at dynamic configuration more because we've seen recent results that optimal hyperparameter values really change over time for reinforcement learning. And as I said, task and task spaces can also vary during training. We might even want to do that ourselves. So it's no surprise that we have methods that have shown that dynamically optimizing the hyperparameters really is beneficial in reinforcement learning. And fortunately, we've also seen that these methods tend to overfit. We're not the first ones showing this. Um, they're just also not as efficient as the methods we have. Here. Like, for example, I think there's there's a lot of potential of um, looking at, at methods like PB2 and seeing where could we really just increase the efficiency and uh, we would probably get much closer to the results we got with them. And um, that also plays into the fact that we don't understand the hyperparameters that well yet. What does it, for example, mean to uh, adjust the hyperparameters more often or less often? And how can we really, uh, really control that meaningfully? That's why I think there are ideas from AutoML that uh, are worth integrating into the AutoML uh, process, both in terms of hyperparameter optimization, but also in terms of meta learning, actually. And the first one of these are fidelities. Uh, I kind of already alluded to this on the last slide. But we don't really have that many insights of how performance on low fidelities and reinforcement learning really translate higher ones. Like, for example, if we look at tasks, it's not really clear how we can measure if success in an easy task really means that we do succeed on more difficult ones. That's not, that's not a given every time. And same with runtimes. Like, we know that uh, there is some correlation. We use multi-fidelity tuning in depth, obviously, and that was successful. But we've also seen results that in some cases, we need to be careful when to really um, get our performance measures. Because it is possible, of course, to do it too early. And we don't really know much about that. But obviously, uh, especially looking at runtime fidelities, we get a, a huge increase in efficiency in automatic models. And I think the same would be true for reinforcement learning, especially in dynamic configuration, where we really uh, want to look at performance during the training process and adapt based on that, having reliable estimates and information about when we can do that is uh, really important. Number two is task features. In AutoML, we often use dataset features, for example, if you want to transfer hyperparameters, if you want to do meta-learning, and that's really hard in reinforcement learning because we really only have high-level human-made task descriptions, and we can't really measure task similarity very well. In R is the direction, of uh, using something like the context I showed you before to really make explicit interpretable task description. But obviously that's only a first step and doesn't help us across different environments. Um, features though could enable a lot of meta-learning methods like meta-learning hyperparameters, transferring and also uh, new methods in curriculum learning where we talk about task ordering. I think this is a really interesting field to tackle. The last one is something that I think is maybe maybe where AutoML is uh, furthest ahead from AutoML currently. It's, it's the usability. It has been very expensive, and there recently have been huge advances in efficiency. Um, like, for example, last month I tested a new implementation of an algorithm that uh, if I implemented on my own, maybe it takes 30 minutes to run, uh, and it took 20 seconds. And uh, I mean, I do realize I'm maybe not an engineer, but that is quite the speed up. 
unfortunately, we haven't really taken advantage of this. Yet. There aren't, isn't much in, the ter in terms of standardized benchmarks that we could use. Thus, paper comparisons are on different domains with different algorithm implementations, different environment implementations. It's very hard to, to compare papers and it's also very expensive to run methods currently. Um, so that's why I really love the development of the AutoRL Bench 1.0. I hope that really continues, that we can look through the AutoML community for proper benchmarking methods and inspiration on how to create benchmarks that serve the community. And I think, um, yeah, the AutoML community can maybe take a look at reinforcement learning in that way, because I do think there's a really high impact to be made by just applying the existing tools, both in terms of insights in terms of just you know, pure tuning uh, to reinforcement learning. I think it can make an immediate impact uh, on the research community. But reinforcement learning, as I said, is, is a really great area to also improve these dynamic configuration methods, whether it's, it's in terms of dynamically analyzing the importance of hyperparameters during training, not just statically for each training run, whether it's um, optimization tools that can, for example, leverage Bayesian optimization in a dynamic way, or whether it's actually learned dynamic algorithm configuration. And then AutoRL, I think, stealing a bit from AutoML tools is also a great idea, like, for example, smart fidelity, where we can get so many efficiency gains. And the idea of task features, where we might need to find a separate way for reinforcement learning how we can make this work. But gray boxing it that way, I think, will be really great for um, better optimization and better meta-learning tools. And then obviously we can build on this with meta-learning tools that can learn hyperparameters, um, can for example do curriculum learning, can ex uh, do exploration based on these features that we really know from the community. So I'd be really curious to hear what you think about the topic, what your next research ideas are, and uh, thank you for listening.